Thanks. And just one other note about the May 14th program. Um, Colleen actually has a, a film on that show as well. And that program's about uh, difference in repetition, uh, which isn't a very sexy title, so we call it different every time. Uh, okay, um, I'd like to start off by just a few quick thanks. First of all, to Catherine Arias, um, Director of Education at MOCA, for her strong support for this collaborative screening series. And also Alana Herrera, Education Assistant at MOCA, who does a lot of the behind the scenes kind of legwork that makes these possible. Um, Adam Hyman, Executive Director of Film Forum, and Kate Brown, our rock star projectionist. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, Jamila James at The Hammer, who hosted Colleen last night for a really excellent artist talk at Art and Practice and helped with some, getting some of the word out for tonight. Um, so the purpose of this series is to um, put experimental film uh, into the context of contemporary art, the back into the context of contemporary art, depending on how you think of it. Um, so I can really think of no one more fitting than Colleen Smith uh, to host here. Uh, she's something of an inspiration to me, especially in that her background is in experimental film and narrative filmmaking, um, and yet uh, she really doesn't let anything uh, affect or limit the kind of work she's going to make and how she's going to make it. So she works in many modes, uh, producing objects, installations, performances, and of course films. She's extraordinarily accomplished. Her first feature, Dry Long So, which she made when she was still a student at UCLA, um, was very well received at the Sundance Film Festival, one best feature at the Los Angeles Pan-African Film Festival, the Philadelphia International Film Festival, among others. Um, she's had a whole host of group shows and solo shows, but including the Studio Museum of Harlem, Contemporary Art Museum of Houston, uh, the New Museum in New York, and solo shows at The Kitchen, uh, Three Walls in Chicago, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and Women in Their Work in Austin. Um, she's also won a lot of awards, and we have all that information in the program notes. Uh, the work that we're going to see tonight, uh, The Way Out is the Way to 14 Short Films about Chicago and Sun Ra, is maybe best described um, by one of the people that we'll actually see in the work itself. Um, it's an improvisational musician describing what it means to be in the pocket when you're playing music. And uh, it says that it's a tension that's caused by the juxtaposition of things, um, specifically by notes that are actually just outside the pocket, something working on the edge. And he says, the pocket, that's where everything plays, that's where everything is. All these things working against something that's solid. Um, and when I heard him say this, it resonated with the experience that I was having watching the video itself. Um, it's actually incredibly fluid in how it moves between different modes of filmmaking, including documentary, uh, quasi-narrative, and seemingly more performative gestures. Um, and that oscillation between the different idioms creates a vibrating tension. Uh, so for me, it's that moment of contact between the two different modes, when it shifts from one to the other, uh, where the affect is. But listening to Smith speak last night, um, I thought of something else, which is uh, how do you make the hopefulness of revolution visible? So obviously, uh, representing the struggle and the strife in any revolutionary act is, um, well, it's not easy. There's a lot of theorizing on that as well, but we kind of know what that looks like. But if you want to revolt, it's obviously because you think that something um, different, hopefully better, is possible. And so how do you make that real and in the world? Um, speaking last night, Smith said something I found profound, which is that ethics is the materiality of exchange. And I think in tonight's work, we see it's an exchange with the subjects themselves that are in the movie, but also with us as an audience. Um, so because the work is made ethically, it presents, it presents an ethical vision of the world. Um, instead of gestures of resistance based on dubious, if not just disingenuous politics, which um, Rebecca Solnit once described in our uh, Under the Big Black Sun catalog essay, The Air Guitar Version of Revolution, uh, Smith makes works that is in and of itself a site of resistance. So I'm reminded of um, what Wittgenstein wrote in his notebooks, Ethics and Aesthetics are one. And of course, this was famously echoed by Larry Neal in describing the black arts movement um, about 50 years later. So I wanted to close with a quote from Neil. In a context of world upheaval, ethics and aesthetics must interact positively and be consistent with the demands for a more spiritual world. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Colleen Smith. description of the work. Thank you. 
Um, I, I, I don't have anything else to say, so I'll say, <laughs> I'll say thank you for coming and I'll be here when it's over to answer any questions.
performance that I think it was last year that you did at Red Cat um, for a little bit over a year maybe ago, and the relationship between doing something live and kind of taking the material, you know, material that is ongoing, obviously in, in your consciousness, or um, and then what it was, what I think this came first, or, and and so how they maybe uh, overlapped or what kind of process came out of this to lead into like a live. Oh, well, the, um, this was really, um, um, this was what I was supposed to be making, <laughs> I guess, you know what I mean? This was like a lot of, um, I land in a city that I don't know, and um, one way that you can um, get people to help you is if um, they're enticed into like making something with you or something, so my camera and Sun Ra became these sort of um, passports to connect with people, um, like the marching band, they like the idea of making a film, and they like the money that I pay them, because it's public school and they need it. Um, and um, so this was really like a, a trying to uh, think about filmmaking the way that Sun Ma talks about improvisation and music making, like trying to find a, another way to make films. I was a little bit burned out about making films with big, heavy crews. It's sort of like um, trying to do calligraphy wearing a catcher's mitt or something. <laughs> like you just can't get at it. And every, and, and, you can't, and, and you can't change course very quickly. You can't respond sometimes. And I was just um, tired of that result, the results. Um, so I was trying to uh, use the camera to uh, like, uh, look at things look at things closely, but then also use the editing to improvise about how, how to make meaning out of that. And then the uh, Black Utopia LP, which is what you're referring to, um, that was just a lot of, that really just started from all the iPhone shots I took in the archives of the stuff that was Sun Ra's or Alton Abraham's. They'll let you take pictures. I just took pictures of everything I could. And that's really, I'm sorry, the good stuff, as far as I'm concerned, that is the good stuff, and I wanted a way to, um, and the audio too. So I pressed the record, which is the sound from archive, and then the, I just started making the slides because technically, you know, that stuff doesn't belong to me. So now in our digital um, economy, a slide really stops the information. It stops there. So like those slides are discrete objects, and they can be replicated, but they won't be, you know, without a great expense. I'd have to know about it. So it's a say, it's a way to share the information without sort of, um, I don't know, endangering like, the fidelity of the archive, I guess, you know. Jesse? Can you talk a little bit about the sequences in the shrink, the psychoanalyst <laughs> hypnotist sessions, right? Because if you sort of dismiss it, right, it's all like a hallucination, and yet out the window you see these <laughs> Oh, I'll try to be brief. Okay, so there's a couple of things. One is the little seeds with the furry orange caps. Those are real. They really look like little people. And they really are seeds. And um, they, the, they have that orange in the, in the tendrils on the seeds is um, caused by a protein called Billy Rubin, which was the character who was hallucinating. And that protein is the only known protein that is shared between plants and humans. And it's in the bird of paradise flower. And, and that's, that's like, that's cool, right? Because that means that this plant is our evolutionary cousin. Like we are, it's our cousin. It's ours. We relate it. We're related to everything. But this is just like now, because of the way we can only believe things if science proves it, now this is real. <laughs> uh, so there was that, like, this is real. This is really, this flower is really my cousin, really. Which is absurd, but it's real, right? Okay, so then there's also um, uh, the invisibility of um, life on the south side, like all the incredible, amazing things you see that are mundane, that in any other context would be bananas. So when I'm filming those two young women walking down the streets and 
Well, when we were walking down the streets in Hyde Park, this little boy literally grabbed his father's hand and said, Dad, where are we? But then all we did was go a few miles south, and we're in Woodlawn, and uh, they're dancing on the street, and this guy rolls by in his Jeep. He's like, what sore are you guys from? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was about that kind of estrangement, cognitive confusion. What did they represent, those two orange hair? They were the seeds. The seeds, yeah. personification. Of yeah, the and same with the little fuzzy ball they were sitting on. So I think that um, the formulation of this identity, this alien identity, occurred in Chicago. That's what brought me to the city, that when I learned that he became Sun Ra in the city, that's what drew me to Chicago. What kind of city produces individuals like him? And there are many, many, many individuals who sort of become themselves in Chicago and then go forth upon the world, from Oprah to Kanye to Obama to uh, Curtis Mayfield to, I mean, like, and this is, the list is too long. The list is too long of, of black uh, geniuses that birthed themselves from the city, either natively or they, they migrated there um, voluntarily or involuntarily. So I think um, I was really interested, and I don't know if I'm answering your question, but uh, <laughs> I was interested in um, the city itself as uh, the place, in all of its sort of conflicts, and divisions and, um, you know what I mean? Like its problems are part of what produce this, is like part of the incubator that produces these amazing creatives, you know? And then on the north side, there's like Harry Parch, and there's like, you know what I mean? It's not just black folks, it's just like the city produces amazing creatives. And um, I don't know, I just, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't separate the streets or the buildings or the parks or the, birds or the manholes from the sounds. They would seem like, especially knowing how much time Sun Ra spent like actually sort of in the park, uh, outdoors, talking to people, exchanging ideas, arguing about um, you know numerology and um, the nation of Islam and all of that stuff. All of that stuff is outdoors as well as you know in the books. Is that okay? Um, I was just wondering if you uh, could say a few words on the like the politics of improvisation, and how it mm -hmm. um, yeah plays into your practice as an artist and a filmmaker. You guys are asking really <laughs> <laughs> politics of prom improvisation. Um, yeah. Well, there is there is a politics to it of of, of it of 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 why it. Of, of, it, of its presence and its necessity. Um, 
the first being um, just a fundamental understanding of improvisation is, as you put it in the program notes, is um, where I come from, the ability to improvise means you really know your shit. That you can't, you can't wing it unless you inhabit it fully. Um, which is very different from sort of a, a dominant culture idea of improvisation being an ad hoc, making do, kind of oopsie kind of <laughs> situation. It's quite the opposite. Um, uh, th so the idea that you could have like a really clear sense of temporality and form and structure, but have no need to, to materialize it until it's enacted, embodied, is amazing, right? That's sort of, uh, ra that's radical. That's just radical right there. Like you don't need to build a, a form or you don't even need to write it down. You don't need to sort of dictate the terms that improvisation can incur uh, when two individuals who understand uh, that the materials they're working with like actually listen to one another. And then through that listening, they can create something like a really, you know, a real structured form, like something tangible, but out of just the process of exchange. I don't know. I mean, that's amazing, right? That's that's like I just I'm still not done thinking about that or trying to learn learn how to do it. You know. I have a kind of follow-up question. It's very hard, but it's also very useful to shoot musicians at play. Yeah. And you've done, you have two extraordinary sequences. Could you share uh, how you did that? I mean, did you, did you have many takes, or did you just, oh. OK. How, yeah. how, did, how did you yeah. do those two sequences? Yeah, yeah, um, I, I'm just tracking down. Those are, uh, both of them are members of the um, um, Improvisational Creative Music Collective, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Music, which is a 40-year-long collective, one of the longest-running collectives in the country um, of uh, members who are um, masters of improvisation. Um, Mawata Bolden, the gentleman who played that, I think it's called an Ultra Contra Bassoon. Does anybody else, does anybody? I have to take my word for it. Okay. Um, uh, How do you spell his name? M W A T A. Bowden, B O W D E N. Um, I, I uh, you know, I, I get to Chicago and I'm like, uh, uh, do you know, do you know this fellow? So everyone tells me I need to meet this fellow. When I read um, A Power Stronger Than Itself by George Lewis, the book, the history of the AACM, Mwata is figured prominently as he's um, of such a long-standing member. Um, you know, I just said, would you be interested in uh, improvis in making an impro improvisation for the camera? Um, and, and almost everybody I talked to who I could get, you know, get a conversation with said absolutely. Um, and, and, and they're like, where do you want to do it? And I'm like, where do you want to do it? So they all picked, he teaches at uh, New York Chicago, so they all picked their sites. Um, and, um, and then I didn't tell them anything. I just showed up with a camera and they improvised until they were done. And um, the thing with Amwata is that I was holding my breath because it just started getting better and better. But I started to understand what he was building, right? Like as it goes, you're like, oh my goodness, he's actually putting together a really like dense thought. And it's just like five minutes in, it's just starting to come together. And um, you know, the, um, the Canon 70s only do like four gigs at a time. So I'm just like, oh. Oh, and like literally he finished, he like poured that thing and like it just emptied and then my camera just like flicked off. <laughs> and I didn't move the camera because I didn't know what I could possibly do that was more interesting than them. I mean, I, I, the, the problem, and the, the, I had the good fortune of having a camera operator when I shot Mata, but when it was Renee, it was me, which is why that was less, you know, accomplished. Um, can't operate the camera. Um, I just got so excited. I was like behind the camera, I was on a tripod, but then she just started shredding, and I just, I, I did what I just did, I just like spazzed out, and the camera went crazy, <laughs> and took it out, and I was just like, just trying to, like, I just got so excited that I, I'm not like, so basically the exchange though was, uh, will you please improvise for the camera, where would you like to do it? And then I showed up, and I didn't, they, they brought their whatever they wanted. Moata brought five different instruments, um, I knew, I asked him to play that one though, because I'd seen him play it.
Any interactions with uh, the orchestra? It, they're based in Philly, right? Well, uh, not formally. I mean, yeah. I have to. The house. I, 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 I then never had one. I was focusing on Chicago, so they're not there anymore. Um, so for this project, the way I conceived of it, I didn't really have a need to reach out to them or make contact with them. I did get to meet them uh, just to last. I got to be in a parade with them, which was really crazy, but no formal interaction or conversations or interviews. Mm -hmm. Would you, I'd also just slightly, would you be willing to talk a bit more about the relationship of Sun Ra and Alton Abraham? Oh, yeah. And the creation of this archive as well, but just their relationship, Yeah, I, I mean, the, that's the amazing thing about the archive that was rescued. It was basically a lot of papers, ephemera, um, from Alton Abraham's basement that were being, um, there, when he passed away, his family just had to get rid of it. And they got rid of a lot of stuff before people figured out what they were throwing away. So um, uh, a music a critic, an art dealer, and man of many talents in Chicago, John Corbett, got word of it and bought like everything he could from this family. He bought, he like pulled stuff out of the the, the dumpster and just like got everything he could from this family because he like opened up a chest and a paper said it like had Sun Ross bra line, so he just bought everything. The papers are the most mundane. This is a really I related to this too, really disorganized kind of way of record keeping where they would kind of just have a box and then put stuff in it and then never look at it again. And um, so it's everything from Western Union receipts of Alton Abraham wiring some raw money in, um, in New York. And wiring it is, amounts to like $22, uh, just whatever he had, like whatever, you know what I mean? So it's this really poignant um, friendship you know what I mean? Um, uh, there's, um, in the audio archive, there's phone conversations where Sun Ra wants Alton Abraham to audio record over the phone a poem he's just written. But Alton Abraham's like, hold up, hold up, I don't have the mic set up. And Sun Ra's like, hurry up, I don't have all day. And it's like, they <laughs> back and forth. You got it, you got it. And then Sun Ra just starts reading it, even though Alton Abraham's still fussing with the, the microphone, he just starts reading. Um, there's, um, you know, canceled checks actually from Philadelphia of Sun Ra paying, it looks like paying rent maybe to um, uh, Marshall Allen's mother, because that's who the house belonged to before they uh, took ownership of it. Um, there's um, ledgers, oh, this is the really, this is the thing that just captivates me, and there's not much to be done about it, but um, a ledger that was all kinds of like doodles and sketches, like like their dream recording studio, like all kinds of like fantastical and mundane things, like how much money is it gonna cost to press 50 records from this, pl like this place in the meatpacking district or whatever. There's all, and it's all, it's every page, you don't know what it's gonna be, but there's one page that's just a list of names. The first name is Herman Blount, which was Sun Ra's name before he became Sun Ra. And the second name is Alton Abraham. And then there are about 35 names after that, and. But we think, when I talked to John Corbett at length about this, we think that list of names are the group of researchers, this like informal group of autodidacts who would get together and share their books, their book collections, and do research primary, uh, what do you call it, primary sources is what they were into, so they could revise history and reinsert the African presence into, his, into the narrative of history. And it's this list, it's like a club, a, a list of names. And it, it, um, yeah, uh, and you know, and yeah, it was called the Tomei in Institute or the El Saturn Research Institute. He had several names for this group of people. Um, and then um, books, so many books that have liner notes in the handwriting of Alton Abraham and Sun Ra or one or the other that Alton Abraham kept. Um, and this relationship continued long after Sun Ra left Chicago because when he left in 61, I think he intended to come back, but he, he didn't. And, uh, but they were, they kept exchanging tapes, money, materials, papers, all kinds of things for decades. It just made me think of one quick thing. And then we're getting that Sun Ra ephemera here. But did El Saturn then, the research group, precede his renaming as Sun Ra? Because he described himself as coming from Saturn. And people would say, like, oh, you're from the planet Saturn. Oh. But one could, of course, redefine it then as coming out of this group, uh -huh. this research 
I don't know. I, I can't answer that. Again, I'm really not an expert. I'm just a fan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Me too.